old trails and ghost towns. Share the adventures of our early pioneers as we explore the development of the Pacific Northwest and beyond with your host, Mike Roberts, and historian, Bill Barley. Welcome to Gold Trails and Ghost Towns. Mike Roberts with Bill Barley, our storyteller, historian, and a general factotum of mining knowledge. You know, every time we tell these stories, I find something new and fascinating about British Columbia, northwest corner of BC, yep. up in that remarkable country, rivered you know, with inlets yep. and uh, fjords, we're heading up there to look at a town that doesn't exist anymore. That's right. We're looking at one of the great copper camps of British Columbia, one of the top three, no doubt about it at all. And when you look at that Portland Canal area and the general area in that vicinity, you had a number of old camps. Stewart is well known. Well, it's still there. It's, yeah. it's thriving. For sure. Alice, Alice, Alice Arm is well known as well. Silver City. But there was a fourth town which came and went. And it took a quarter of a century. We're talking about the rise and fall of a camp called Aniox. Aniox. Yep. A N Y O X. Correct. Okay. Interesting name. All right. We're going to tell this story about Aniox and uh, this, uh, even a treasure story at the end. So don't go away. Gold Trails and Ghost Towns is in the northwest corner of British Columbia. Welcome back to Gold Trails and Ghost Towns, talking about Antioch, northwestern corner of British Columbia. Yep. Uh, 1910, you figure, the mining interest started, but when did they first, yeah. I guess, prospectors get into that area? Well, it goes back about 25 years before, 1885. Three American prospectors came, and we think they're American. They were placer guys looking for placer gold in that wilderness corner of British Columbia. Didn't find any. So it kind of... Uh, Language. Nothing happens really, not very much in any of those areas, but in 1898, three of the Indian chiefs in that area, Nelson is the name of one, Gurney is the name of the other, and Allen is the name of the third chief. Mm -hmm. And they're all uh, Nishka Indians, come from the Nass River area, and they like a, an archdeacon from the Anglican Church, and a guy called William Collison. Now this is interesting because he wrote a book. This is Collison's book, yeah. In the Wake of the War Canoe, talks about his time on the North Coast sure. from about 1870 to 1914. Yeah. This is that Collison. Yeah, same family. He's right. up there for over 40 years. But is an archdeacon normally interested in uh, yeah. mineralization? He was a man of many talents, shall we say, okay? Yeah. And very devout man. And uh, Don't mistake me, on I'm not criticizing the family because he was a very devout man. But he was also interested in what the Indians called chickaman stone, which is metal. And the three chiefs said to him, evidently, there are three mountains in this country, and you are interested in Chickaman Stone. One is a mountain of copper, the other is a mountain of silver, and the other is a mountain of gold. And so he became a very avid listener immediately, and they decided to show him or tell him about the mountain of copper first. And he formed a very loose alliance with several other individuals in the area, and they went in and staked this, this group, a group of claims, copper claims, high-grade copper, on the surface, Mike, very interesting indeed, you know, three, four, five percent, some copper nuggets showing and so on, and they called this the Bonanza Group. And uh, so the Indians watched this process, and they were very interested in the activity, and it caused a lot of interest from Butte, Montana, and other players in the copper game. And finally, in 1899, Chief Nelson came back and said, uh, Archdeacon, you know, he said, um, you have got part of it, but you haven't got all of the Copper Mountain, he said. There's another part. And he told him about the second part. And as it happened, the Archdeacon was busy, so he sent his son Max in, and Max staked a new group, which he called the Hidden Creek Group. And thus, Antioch came into being. Okay, and there is Antioch now yeah. with a bunch of players who really probably don't have the will, wherewithal to to make it into anything. Well, actually, a couple of them did. Some were from Butte, Montana. A big banker from Butte, Montana came in, and he had a lot of money. He spent a quarter of a million dollars in there and finally got tired of it and gave it to W.K. Rogers, who was also from Butte, Montana, and said, get rid of it. Well, then the big player comes onto the market, and the big player had Copper Mountain and Phoenix. This is the Granby Corporation, the Canadian oh, company everywhere. out of Montreal. I mean, they, I mean, there it is. They're, yeah. they're down in the, in the boundary country sure. as well, is it? Sure. If anybody can mine copper, it's the Granby Corporation. They drill, they look around, they say, hey, this is a magnificent find. They know they're running out of ore in Phoenix, so they pay $500,000 for the whole shebang. You know, the dam and the partially completed sound town site and all the rest of it. Then by 1914, they're ready to roll. They start building the town. They put in a smelter, and it's a huge smelter, very modern smelter. It will, 
it will actually, uh, 2,000 tons of ore can go through that smelter and pro be processed and refined every day. Now, when you, we're looking at the photographs right now yeah. of Antioch, yeah. you can tell it's a company town. I mean, sure. the shingles are all company oh, standard. Yeah, course, the, course. the window casings are yeah. all company yeah. paint. I mean, this place is laid out. And yeah. wh what were they thinking on? Were they thinking well, of how much, much involvement, how many years here? Well, the, you know, the, uh, the Granby Company knew they had to have good miners. Some of those miners were coming from Phoenix and other parts, and they wanted decent houses to live in. And they charged, the, they charged really quite a reasonable rate, between $10 and $15 a house per month and the miners were getting to two and a half dollars a day. And so the town begins to take shape, and the town is kind of interesting because, you know, there's a big, for instance, there's a huge hotel in the, in the town. Company owned, That's of company owned, of yeah. course. And the miners are not averse to having participating in some imbibing in alcohol and so on. <laughs> they drink and, uh, vast they, quantities, I take it. did indeed, and they haven't changed a lot. <laughs> and they used to come to the bar, and some of them wouldn't even wait to take the cork out of the bottle, which is, you know, 1910, 1912, 1914. They'd break the bottle right off and, and drink right there. Out of the ragged end. Yeah, and, and the bar was so big, it was 60 feet long, Mike. I've seen 30-foot <laughs> bars, but I haven't seen a 60-foot bar. And it was so long, they called it long bar. Very imaginative. Very course. creative. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, the bartenders, they had to drink in shifts. They actually did drink in shifts. So they were all done for an hour, an hour and a half, depending upon the pressure on the, from the guys outside. And after their shift was over, nobody would move. So the bartenders would lock, lock elbows, and they'd run and clear the room. All the, all the miners pushed out the door, and then the new group would come in. Some of the old ones tried to scramble back in. I guess those too. old drinkers, they, they, they were, sure. they, their quantities had sort of waned by this time. They needed to get a new batch in ah, who could drink ah, larger quantities quicker. And, and there was some, you know, it wasn't a rough town. For instance, like many company towns, nobody locked their doors. In fact, few people had a key. And yet there were rough spots in town. Hogan's Alley was fairly rough, you know. I mean, the, the barbers were there and, uh, and the pool halls were there. So that was for the, for the bachelors and so on. The barbers, by the way, are interesting in, in Antioch because these guys would sit down and they'd shear hair at the end of the week or during the week and the miners would come in. The miners worked seven days a week, so it was, it was kind of an off and on job. Yeah. They all became prospectors and they became very good prospectors. Well, there's no better listener than a barber, right? Of course, right? and not only that, they'd pick out the best prospector and say, okay, we'll bankroll you, okay? Essentially, they would. So they'd grub stake a good, good prospector and get a cut of the proceedings. Well, they didn't have all the property tied up? The company didn't have all the property tied up at this time? No, you, you could prospect in that country for 100 years and still not get all the property there. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, that, that's obvious. Anywhere in a tough country like that, very steep terrain, it, it, it's, it's extremely rough around the edges. And, you know, like every, like every small mining town, there were a lot of nicknames. The town constable there was a guy called Jack Hutchings. And, you know, this guy was interesting. They call him Big John. And he was the single constable in a town of, which at one time was over 2,000 people. That's it's all amazing how yeah. few police officers you needed. I mean, were these guys naturally law-abiding, or was he just that mean? No, he wasn't mean. He was fair, and that's all they wanted, you know, essentially. And uh, another guy, Mr. Heron, he was smiling Sam Heron. Right, smiling yeah. Sam, and and one of the one of the miners there, he only he only went by the nickname Bill, but they called him Shovel Nose Bill because oh, the gee. appendage was rather prominent. Uh, you that's see. a cruel thing, yeah. isn't and, it? Yeah, uh, and and a guy called McDonald was whispering McDonald. You could hardly hear him speak. What, any reason for that? Was well, he injured no, he or smoked he... very very low? You know, he was he was rather taciturn. Didn't speak very loud. Mining so communities are yeah. big for nicknames. They just yeah, like they to. Just, sure. That's a familiarity. That when I was a kid in Rossland, every second guy, every miner virtually had a nickname. Some were not very, uh, <laughs> you know, honorific. They, they weren't. That's true. Okay, but, like like shovel nose Bill, I think, yeah. is a bit of a harsh, yeah. harsh, harsh moniker. Carry that moniker for the rest of your life. Yeah. And I guess like every time we've done a mine show uh, before, they've always uh, gotten into the spirit of uh, festivals and. Sure. Uh, and sure. statutory holidays. Actually, you know, there's a good shot here, and I, I, I kind of like it because it shows what was really happening in Antioch. First of all, the hills are burned off because the sulfur, sulfur just is, denudes the hills. That's Absolutely. what the smelter did. Sure, smelted the, for miles around, and you'll see that all through the Antioch area. And these are w women. These are women pushing a barrels. Barrel this race. is a barrel race. One of them's got the barrel off kilter a little bit, but yeah. this is a barrel race. And, you know, there are heavy bets on, on some of the boxing matches, and uh, certainly on the baseball games. And the baseball games were between Stewart and Antioch and, and uh, some of the towns nearby. And often they went, they went to Stewart, you know, on Dominion Day. And they, here's an example of how Stewart looked in those years. And pretty colorful looking town. I, I kind of like Stewart, I like the, the way it looks.
and all that country. It, it pictured these little pockets of civilization, relatively, yeah, sure. in this huge wilderness in yeah. this area. Yeah. And they did like to exchange greetings occasionally. Oh, sure they did. And sometimes the, the brass band was an Indian brass band from the Nass River country, uh, Greenville. And uh, so they came in, and they were well entertained, and uh, they mixed very, very well. So, so it was a fascinating country, and attracted those people to the edge of the frontier. But you know, not everything mo travels smoothly. When they, when they blew in the smelter in 1914, the price of copper was pretty good, and then World War One buoyed that price of copper. At the end of World War One, copper began to drift a little bit, and uh, drift down. And the price was, was, you know, very, very important to the survival of the whole Antioch's uh, smelter and town site. And Granby watched it very closely. So it went down under the 20 cent mark, and then it went down to 15, then it went down to 12. And, 12 uh, cents a pound. Yeah, yeah. And then, then it went down lower than that, actually. 1923, kind of an omen of things to come. Big fire almost wiped out the town, and by heroic action by some of the firefighters and most of the miners, they saved the town. But uh, it was on the downhill slope, not much doubt about it, Mike. And as you go through the 1920s, here's, here's the type of, uh, of, of ingot they were producing. And this is a 500-pound ingot. And they had to sell these on the world market in competition all around the world. And what happened, of course, is the price drifted lower and lower. Then they began to pile the ingots up on the dock. They weren't willing to sell them anymore for 500 pounds for 35 bucks. That well, yeah, it went down to that eventually, but it was, you know, it started at 75 yeah. and then down to 60 and then down to 50 and so on. And, uh, and then they had all these ingots piled on, on, the, on the wharf, and this is an example. And the people in, in Antioch called this the copper coffin. They said, when that coffin is full, this town is doomed. This, and it looks That's like right. that. It's almost yeah, it's filled right almost, there. It's almost filled. So yeah. that entire ship shape is 500-pound yeah. ingots all stacked together. Stacked together. Thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of them, Mike. And so the, the Depression of 1929 comes along, and the price plummets below the 12-cent mark down to 7 or 8 cents. And essentially, by 1933, there's considerable animosity between the company and the miners. The miners are earning about $2.40 a day, and the company's taking about $1.10 a day in board. So they're really earning, they're working about 20, 21 days a month, and the $1.10 a day is 30 days a month, or 31, so they're making about 70 cents a day. That's all they're actually taking home. But the company isn't making any money either because there's no market for copper, essentially no market. So they get over this strife, but it's, it's the beginning of the end. There's no doubt about it. By 33, 34, they limp through. Finally, in 1935, the company posts a notice that Antioch is essentially finished. And Antioch is finished. People start moving out. They scatter all over Canada. The Consolidated Mining and Smelting Company comes in and buys the property because they don't want a smelter to compete with them. That's essentially They just what it buy is. the property to shut it down. Well, I think so. All the records were destroyed. So I think that's that's precisely what happened. There's some pretty melancholy photos yeah. here. Look at th this used to be the golf course and yeah, it's now sure. Sure. just a sand pit. That's right. And here are some of the buildings and there they're completely deserted. And this is this is from Antioch, the town that got lost. And this is, uh, we were given permission to use this. Pete Loudon's Pete book? Loudon, yeah, Pete Loudon's book. And he knew people who were there. And uh, so it was kind of kind of sad. But, you know, it wasn't, it was the end of Antioch, but it wasn't the end of the era, you know, or that, or the, or the mining activity in that area. Because certainly, you know, I mean, the premier mine, and here's, here's a photograph of the premier mine, is still going almost 80 years later. And it's produced it's very It's still going close right now, you mean? Today. It's going today, started in 1918, and it produced almost 2 million ounces of gold and 43 to 44 million ounces of silver. And it's still producing with a, with a gang of miners up there right to this day. Right. So, and, and as far as the gold mountain is concerned... This is, I was going to ask, you, we've got yeah. a silver mountain, but sure. th is the gold mountain found? Yeah, we, we think that some of the discoveries up in that, up in that far reach of, of, of Portland Canal and in that area are going to yield some magnificent gold mines, and they're working on them right now. Okay. Some, some mines have been producing. Well, you know, we always try and end one of these programs okay. with a treasure story, and we have just that very thing. And we think, up until this day, we're the only ones who know about it, but then you're going to blab and everybody else will know. It's we're true. going to take a look at a treasure story uh, you'll be the first to know about after Bill and me, right after this break. <laughs> Don't go away.
Welcome back to Gold Trails and Ghost Towns. We're talking about Antioch's. We've kind of put Antioch's to bed, but there's a great treasure story. Yeah, but before we get to the, the treasure story, I think it's important to talk about ore, okay? Because ore figures heavily in our treasure story. Yeah, it does. This is raw copper ore. Yeah. And, so, and, and it looks virtually pure. Yeah, that is pretty pure. That's probably 98%. And so this is what attracted the, the Granby Company to in this area in the sure. first place. Sure. They've got this big smelter already put up, so yeah. any kind of smelting, any kind of refining sure. ore would yeah. obviously come to them. Yeah, they, they, can, they can smelt uh, gold, silver, whatever you want. Whatever they got. Sure. So what happens in around 1919? Well, what happens is this. Big John Hutchings has a son called Oswald Hutchings. Now, uh, Big John is the provincial That's cop, That's the right? provincial, provincial policeman, policeman. Okay. in Antioch. Okay. And it's 1919, and the kid is fairly young. He's hired on by a captain, Captain uh, Gerard. And uh, Gerard has a little book, a little boat called the the Cooprite. It's about 30 feet long. That's all. It's a company boat, and they're called to Princess Royal Island. Now, Princess Royal Island is some distance away from uh, from Antioch, but not too far. It's about two and a half days run, but. They're called there because there are a whole bunch of mines on Princess Royal Island, and they're high-grade gold mines out of quartz. So the ore they get there is basically quartz, and most of those mines, the Belmont, the Surf Inlet, uh, the Princess Royal, a number of other mines there, discovered by prospectors some years before. They used to send their, 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 their ore way down to Crofton, which had a smelter in Vancouver Island. Well, now Antioch is closer, so they send their high-grade ore to Antioch. So they get a call, and Captain Gerard and a guy called Stewart, another deckhand called Stewart, and young Oswald Hutchings, they jump on this boat and they battle the storm all the way up into, into Surf Inlet, which is on, on Princess Royal Island, and um, pick up a barge with 250 tons of high-grade ore. Now you're guessing at how much gold was in that ore. I'm saying, Mike, probably at least 1.85 ounces per ton. Which nearly is rich. two ounces to nearly the ton. Nearly two ounces to the ton. Now remember, there are several things you have to consider. First of all, gold in 1919 was selling at twenty dollars and sixty-six cents a troy ounce. Nowhere near as valuable as it is now. Now it's five hundred dollars Canadian, a little more Better than, than five hundred, which was going for you know yeah, that's right. a dollar a pound or something. Yeah, well, well, way less. Than way than that. that. Yeah, it was going down to fifteen cents a pound. So anyway, they fight the storm coming all the way back. And they're, you know, they're going down between the islands, and they finally come into, into Granby Bay, right where the smelter is. They dock their boat, the barge is behind, they throw the line from the barge to the watchman. Okay? Okay. And the watchman, they tell him, look, at it's high tide, they get in at 2.30 in the morning, so it is high tide, and they say, leave a slack line. The watchman doesn't leave a slack line, he leaves a taut line. Tide goes down, line tautness doesn't break, tips, of course, tips the barge over, all the ore slides into the deep harbor, and I don't know how deep the harbor is there. This is the first time this story has ever been told. So 250 tons of high-grade ore. Now, the obvious answer, Mike, is why didn't the company go and get it? Why didn't they go and get it? <laughs> well, because it's only worth about $9,000 at 1.85 ounces a ton. Would it cost them as much to get uh, it up as it, co as uh, it cost probably, as it was worth? Probably cost more. And they're not even sure they can get it up. They have to get deep sea divers in from Vancouver. And this is so, 1919. Yeah, this right. is not a, a science at and this stage of the game. Probably their insurance pays it. This is a very wealthy company. So they're not even going to bother. And the interesting thing about this story, it has never been published anywhere. It came out of a 244-page a, a manuscript that was used as the basis for a thesis on Antiochs. Written by? Written by Oswald Hutchings, who was on the boat. He was there, and he just passed it off as an accident. And he passed his thesis on to you? Well, actually, the individual who got his 244-page his, uh, uh, manuscript took it for a thesis, and the guy who got, got that manuscript passed a copy of the thesis on to me because he'd watched our program. So, so here we've got 250 tons of yeah. pretty high-grade ore, yeah. two ounce to the ton gold. Very close. Probably you're going to get 450 ounces out of that, maybe 475 ounces at $520 an ounce. So there's, uh, you know, there's approximately a quarter of a million dollars sitting at the bottom, I think, right now as we're talking, at the bottom of Granby Bay in the old ghost town of, of, of Antioch. 
And to get that quarter of a million out, what do you yeah. figure it would cost? Well, I don't know. I mean, it depends what you, well, you get your own, your own tender up there. It'd probably cost you 25000 I would think. Depends how deep the deep the water is. I don't know how deep the water is. Uh, you know, the, he, here's a picture of, uh, of, of, of Granby Bay. And in front of that uh, picture is a boat, and undoubtedly Union steamships. There's That's a Union steamship yeah, boat sure. sitting right there. So just off the bow of that, uh, just off that dock, Straight down, what do you figure, 60, 80, 100 feet down or something like that? I don't know. I don't know how deep the bay is. I'm flying blind here. I mean, if it was 10 feet, I'd go up and get it myself. <laughs> a 250 tons of high-grade yeah. gold ore. Worth about a quarter of a million dollars, probably. That's not a bad, that's not a bad uh, treasure story. No, it, But it requires great. too much work, you see. I want my treasure to be in sort of preformed ingots, yeah. but somebody willing to do well, a little remember, work. Well, remember something else about treasure. If this is high-grade quartz and gold seated in quartz, and it's free gold, almost definitely from Surf Inlet or Belmont, that is worth probably double the price of gold. Why? Because the specimen buyers like it. Oh, you and mean it the will story be shot attached, right through there? And sure. Sure. So that we're, we're putting at the gold value at a quarter of a million dollars. It may be worth half a million dollars if it's very attractive, quartz laced with gold, and it goes up dramatically in price. All right, so there is our treasure story. It That's just requires right. a little bit of work, yep. but it's sitting there right off that shore. Sure. You know, this is the other thing that amazed me. When we went looking for modern maps to find yep. out where Antioch's is, it's not noted on any no, maps. No. You'd have to go I mean, Stewart's there. That's and right. I've got it in some maps, Mike, that go back to the 1920s and the early 1930s. But Antioch's is, uh, you know, is, is simply gone. The creek is noted on the maps. That's true. And the Bonanza Creek close by is noted on them. So there's Antioch's Creek, there's Bonanza Creek, and of course, Old Granby Bay. But the people who inhabited Antioch's for that 25 years, 1900 and 1910 to 1925, uh, and uh, remember, uh, 1935, they're long gone. You know, there they're, they're very few survivors. There are a few kids are still around that were in Antioch's and in the 30s and born there. Uh, Denny Boyd of the Vancouver Sun is an example. He was born in Antioch's. One of the few individuals One of the I few know. people sure. who can claim that. That's right. And old Denny went on to become the great bar reporter for Vancouver and left his Antioch's roots far behind. Indeed he did. You know, you tell a story about the prospectors in that area. Yeah. You, if all the country's straight up and down, you've got lots of water. Sure. Why not go by boat as you prospect? They, a lot of them did. They completely changed sure. technology in this regard. Yeah, their technique was rather different. You know, ordinarily when you roll a boat, you're pulling like this. And, and you're the facing bows, the stern, yeah. the prows, prows behind you or the bows behind you. They turned around. They faced the bow and they pushed on the oars slowly. Any very particular slowly. reason well, for Well, sure. This? They want to look at the mountains and the ledges and see if there are any veins up there. Does this look promising, etc.? And they did discover some magnificent places, such as Princess Royal Island. And it just, they looked goofy for a while, yeah. but, I mean, success allowed them to do but those But you had to be favors. a good reader of weather as well. Yeah. <laughs> the place is Antioch's. The origins, just amazing. They connect with an, uh, an Anglican church minister in the late 1800s, and that turns into the largest copper smelter in the British Empire, larger than anything else in southern parts of Canada, and it is Antioch's. They haul copper out of there up until 1935, and now the place is just gone. But don't forget the gold ore in the harbor. See you next time on Gold Trails.